Welcome everyone. So I'm going to present the paper entitled Quantum Security Analysis of AES, which is a joint work with Xavier Bontin and Marianne Plasencia. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of context and then um, we're going to see how to solve such problems with quantum algorithms. And uh, after that, I'm going to go into the details of uh, the best attack we developed in this paper which is a quantum attack on h one as 256 Okay, so in this paper, we are studying the security of black ciphers in the presence of quantum adversaries. So it is well known that uh, some classical symmetric cryptography constructions have been broken if you're able to use quantum queries, for example, the even monster cipher. But these are specific examples with a very strong structure which will not be the case here. So we're going to see uh, what we can do still. We know that a quantum adversary is capable of local quantum computations, uh, still capable of doing classical encryption queries, and potentially doing quantum queries. The fact that uh, no such structure exists in our example doesn't really mean that the adversary is completely hopeless. At, uh, there, there may be still something better to do than simple global search. So in this paper, we are studying the well-known standard AES. So it is an SPN with 128-bit blocks, which are represented as a 4x4 four four byte matrix. In an AES round, you exalt the round key, apply the AES box to each byte separately. Uh, there is a shift of each row in this matrix, and then uh, we multiply the, each column by the AES MDS matrix. The number of rounds depends on the key length, and uh, as does the key schedule. So for AES 256, which is our main target, um, there are 14 uh, rounds. Um, for AES 128, there are only 10 rounds. So we are going to uh, study key recoveries in the secret key model. We have a black box, um, and we want to find the secret key of this black box. Classically, uh, exhaustive key search is simply doing a few queries uh, to the black box and then trying all keys until the encryption match. Uh, if you have a key recovery that goes below this complexity of trying all keys, um, this is an attack on a radio strong version. And this, the number of rounds attack will determine the security margin of AES. In the quantum setting, we know that we can use Grover's algorithm to speed up uh, the key recovery and to find the key in to the 128 equivalent AES encryption. But the question is, what is the quantum security margin of AES? What is the highest number of rounds for which we have a better procedure to recover the key than uh, the exhaustive search? So in this paper, we study quantum key recovery attacks on register of versions of AES. Um, it turns out that uh, of the best attacks that we found required only standard encryption queries, classical encryption queries. And also some of these, uh, some of the ideas that we had to use uh, also gave new time space radars for classical attacks. So Grover's bound is actually a very strong constraint and the number of rounds that we're able to reach will be actually smaller than the classical uh, best attacks. And it turns out to be uh, one round less than in each case. Uh, we're using uh, square attacks, quantum square attacks, and uh, Demisi Selsuk meet in the middle attack that I'm going to explain uh, in my presentation. But first, let's see what we do best in a quantum setting, uh, which is search problems, exhaustive search. Um, and let's start with the, the bound that we're going to set which is Grover's aggressive search on the key, uh, how much does it cost? It's actually a tricky question. Uh, we have a way to write quantum algorithms as uh, in an abstract manner uh, using the quantum circuit model. And they are represented as reversible circuits, so we can count the number of gates in these circuits, and this gives us quantum time complexity. But, um, well, there are many trade-offs possible, and uh, there are many uh, optimizations possible of these circuits. 
And it's actually not easy to, to write this down. So this was done actually by uh, Grasse et al. This was the count that we use uh, for reference in our paper. Um, if you consider a quantum circuit for the AES, it turns out that the most costly component is the S-box. Because the S-box is a small nonlinear function, which classically is most often tabulated. And it's not the case in the quantum setting. So it's uh, there is a most costly component. And that way we can count uh, everything of our complexities in the number of S-boxes that we use, that we need to evaluate. And so our bound for H round AES 256, for example, is uh, the key can be recovered in 2 to the 138 S-boxes, which means if we go below this bound, we have an attack. We have something that's better than Grover's algorithm. Now things are going to be a bit more technical because classically, attacks are complex procedures. Um, and quantumly, this is, of course, also going to be the case. We need to be able to write more complicated algorithms than Grover's search, but still, uh, one of the best uh, building blocks that we have is Grover Search. We show next that this building block can be used to design algorithms, uh, search algorithms that works in the same way, classically and quantumly. So how so? Suppose that you have a search space, and suppose that you have a predicate uh, that is going to determine uh, good elements in this subspace. And you want to find good elements, so we define this operation, which is filter among this search space, all the good elements, which means actually lazy sampling uh, good elements from the search space. Classically, you do that by sampling elements from X, the search space initial one, until uh, the predicate evaluates the true. And this costs you uh, this time complexity. Quantumly, things are a bit different because we use Gorbachev's algorithm to benefit from its uh, quantum speedup. So we have to start from the uniform superposition over the good subspace, over the, sorry, the search space. And we use Grover's algorithm to transform this superposition into a uniform superposition over the good subspace. And the number of times we have to iterate our operations of sampling and evaluating the test is reduced by a square root. So quantum search is a bit different from classical search. Intuitively, as I said, classical search is only testing elements at random until we find a good one. And this is doing that. Uh, taking an element, uh, it's not good. Another one is not good. Another one is not good. This one is good. We're finished. Quantum laser search is a stateful operation that starts from a state which uh, is a superposition over the whole search space and then modifies it into a superposition over the good subspace. But, well, this is an operation that can be also used as a subcomponent in an algorithm. In the same way that classically, in order to sample from the space X, you could use another search. I'm going to take an example for that. Imagine that we have to evaluate a conjunction predicate, um, which is uh, we want elements that satisfy P1 and P2. So naively, we would only take elements from X and check if P1 is true and, P and if P2 is true, and we will have uh, this first formula. But we can better, using lazy evaluation, we're going to take elements from X, evaluate P1, and evaluate P2 only if P1 is already true. This saves a little time. It turns out that this lazy evaluation can be also rewritten as a combination of filters you're actually doing a search among all elements satisfying P1 for an element that in addition satisfies P2. And it did search to sample from XP1, and you're testing if the element satisfies P2. So this is an acid search. In the quantum setting, we'll have a similar procedure. We'll have a Grover search among XP1 in which the sample operation is also a Grover search that produces XP1. And the test is only testing P2. So this, um, this is a generic principle that it takes the following. If you have a procedure, which is a combination of filters, so we call that a filtering operation, 
or lazy samplings or procedures that well, look this way. Um, you have a corresponding quantum procedure, which is a combination of quantum searches. And to get to one from one to another, you change the time complexity by taking square roots over all the number of iterations in this nested procedure. And that's it. This gives you a recipe for a quantum attack. The idea would be first write a classical attack, written as a combination of uh, filters. Um, so it's going to be a classical attack of a very specific form. And then we take each of these filters and we replace it by a quantum search. We obtain a quantum algorithm that does the same. And this, this complexity, the complexity of this quantum algorithm is obtained by computing the complexity of the classical one and replacing the number of iterations by square roots. If in the classical attack the search terms are dominant, you get a global square root factor, which means that if your attack is below classical exhaustive search, then your quantum attack is also going to be below exhaustive search. It's going to be below Grover's algorithm. Or at least it can be, uh, because there is some technical post-processing post to do. Uh, we have to check a posteriori that there are small factors that separate quantum from exhaustive search. We also to check the success probabilities and so on. Um, but the 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 most like the, these quantum technicalities can be handled later. Uh, at the time, we already uh, we're already almost sure that we have uh, a good attack. Okay, let's see uh, how it goes with an example uh, in our paper of a quantum attack on H1 AES, 256. Uh, so this attack follows the Demis-Sesuk meet in the middle principle and the improved version by Derbez, Hook and Jean. It starts from a rebound distinguisher on five rounds AES. So there is a property that says if you have an AES of five rounds, regardless of the round keys, and if you have an input-output pair which has an input difference active in only one byte, and an output difference active in only one byte also. The bytes can be anywhere. So you have such a pair. Now if you encrypt uh, a sequence of states which are which which are obtained from this pair but making the difference uh, the blue dif in the blue box here taking some arbitrary values and calling that a delta sequence. And if you collect the sequence of output differences in the right byte. It turns out that these sequences in output can take only uh, 2 to the 192 possibilities. Uh, so there are 2 to the 192 possible sequences that you are able to, to obtain with a 5 round AES. If it wasn't 5 round AES, you would be able to obtain any, any, any sequence. So without going into the technical details, the idea uh, of this distinguisher is that you write all the rounds here. If you have this input and this output differential, you can start from both ends. You can guess a few, but just a few, bytes of the internal state. And you can complete the whole path by solving AES S-box differential equations. So this equation says, uh, I give you an input and output difference on an S-box, and there is approximately, on average, one possible byte value that has this input and output difference. So half the time there are two possibilities and half the time there are zero possibilities. Um, and so in the end you only have 24 byte, bytes, uh, state bytes to guess to um, complete the whole path using these equations. And once you have the whole path then if you put a difference here, you can propagate everything right until the end. Okay, so this uh, property is going to fit here in our attack. So we put uh, the middle rounds here and we're going to have some key byte guesses uh, in the first and in the last rounds. So here is the idea and it's really following the uh, classical attack principle. 
We first have to query our AES black box to find many pairs, input output pairs that satisfy uh, these uh, conditions. So active in uh, only a diag diagonal here in input and active only here in output. If we have enough pairs that satisfy these conditions, then we can proceed uh, with an exhaustive search over the key bytes that I put uh, uh, with the bullet points here. Uh, so there are 10 such key bytes. And for each choice of them, we have approximately one pair that is going to satisfy the blue to red path here. And we can find this pair. Then, let's see, uh, we have such a pair, so we can start making, making the difference in the blue byte vary. This means that we have to make new queries. And uh, so I, we take new differences in the blue bytes and we have to, um, we have to partially decrypt using the key byte guesses to get to an input state that we encrypt with the black box. We partially decrypt the output to get the difference in the right byte. But we use the key byte cases, basically. So we can uh, make the difference in blue byte vary, collect the difference in the red byte. And now we can find whether the difference, the sequence of differences in the red byte belongs to the possibilities that gives us uh, the distinguisher. Classically, we tabulate the distinguisher. So we have a big table and just check whether we are on this table. And uh, the table will be too big for us, actually so we don't uh, tabulate it. And now we have to make another search inside the search. Let's see, do we have an attack here? We have 10 key bytes to search through and we have 24 bytes to guess in the middle states. This means uh, naively that we have 34 bytes and this is bigger than exhaustive search of the key. So this is not an attack yet, but we can do a bit better because there are relations between the key bytes that we guessed and the middle uh, states that we are sieving through. And there are, we found actually four relations that come from the key schedule of AES-256, which means we now have only 30 byte degrees of freedom to search through. And this is smaller than exhaustive search, so we may have an attack. Uh, and we, so in the classical setting, we evaluated that we would need uh, 2 to the 250 S boxes instead of uh, 263 for exhaustive search. There are many details that need uh, investigation. For example, we need something to solve the S box differential equation. Because when we are saving the possible states in the middle, we have to recompute everything. We have to recompute basically this table that we are not tabulating. So we needed to give a circuit to do this and, and we did that in about two S-Box computations, um, which is much more efficient than uh, doing a global search for the solution of the equation. Quantum queries. Do we need quantum queries? Actually, they seem necessary at first sight. So uh, if we first write down the whole attack, you seem to need uh, quantum queries in the middle, but they can be removed. In terms of that, uh, all the quantum queries we needed to make could be replaced by 2 to the 88 classical queries. Do we need quantum accessible memory? Actually, uh, it seemed also necessary, but we also removed it. So means in the end, the attack only requires classical memory, classical queries, and it more or less looks like, uh, well, it's, it's not much um, resourceful than Grover's algorithm. I must make a little update uh, regarding our paper because, as I said, computing the exact cost of Grover's search is complicated. And actually, uh, since we uh, wrote the, this paper, uh, the cost, um, notably the cost of the S-Box circuit, uh, has been improved. Well, this was a paper of, uh, at Eurocorp 2020 uh, by Jax et al. And there is a, like a factor of 26 in the gate count of the S-Box circuit, which changes 
in our paper, only the relative cost of solving the S-box differential equation. So now the differential equations cost much uh, compared to an S-box. And turns out that this doesn't change our final result because this wasn't the, domin the dominating term in the complexity. So in this quantum attack, we use the Debussy Sussuk meet in the middle principle, but it changed the way it was written. Because initially, uh, initially in the classical setting, we tabulate the rebound distinguisher and we see the subkey bytes. Uh, and in our case, we didn't tabulate the rebound distinguisher, we had to redo the search. This idea can actually be used classically. If you don't tabulate the distinguisher, what you're going to do is to put the key guesses in a table instead. And then you make a search over the degrees of freedom of the distinguisher and you see the key guesses using this search. This gives new time memory trade-offs for key recoveries on the AES, and notably uh, it improves the trade-offs for the nine round attacks on AES 256. So, to summarize, we have analyzed uh, existing attacks on AES and tried to find the best quantum key recovery uh, that that we could um, and this provides the first analysis of the um, secret margin uh, security margin of AES in a quantum setting so these attacks that we obtained which are square attacks and the missus submit in the middle uh, reward them in this search framework that unifies in a sense quantum and classical exhaustive search procedures and this enabled us later to, to, like to analyze in, a, in, in an easier way the, the quantum attack. Basically allows to delay the technicalities, uh, the quantum technicalities while designing the, the attack. Second, we also showed how to exploit the structure of the S-Box to design a, um, an efficient circuit for solving the differential equation, which may be used uh, in other quantum attacks, for example. Uh, so we reach an eight-round uh, eight attack on AES-156. The question is open of whether we can do better than that. And uh, we use also new trade-offs uh, for, classical, for classical attacks in this setting. So that's all uh, for me. Thank you for your attention.